Hello and welcome to the first episode of what we want to call as Sports Tales, where we want to talk about either tactics, adventures, legends, ethics, or simply stories from the world of football, where I take the opportunity to interview somebody who is into a football club or who has different experiences to share from the world of football or from the world of sports. In my first episode, and I have been chasing him for a long time now, it's been four months, I will be finally recording with him and really excited about it. Yeah, my head is a mess, but I will try. How do I introduce him? And I don't even know where to get started with him. So let's just uh, cut to the chase. He's a friend of mine who I know exactly for a year and uh, we studied together, got to know each other when we were supposed to be in a semester abroad in Madrid, which worked out quite well for the first six weeks. And then it just went downhill thanks to the situation that's going around the world with the virus. Uh, let's not get started about that. But yeah, we survived Corona together. That's a story that maybe he would like also like to share. And uh, But yeah, for me, this guy, this man, Nico, a very open-minded person to befriend, somebody I really and greatly look up to. It's so amazing that I can connect to somebody who's a few years older to me, but we still manage to sync on so many different levels. <laughs> so, Nico, do you want to chip in on <laughs> that should. first? Um, yeah, first of all, thanks for this uh, very warm introduction. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm happy to be your guest. I um, was, uh, was looking forward um, to this, uh, to be your guest in this episode, my first podcast, actually. So, I'm yeah, as much excited as you. And um, yeah, looking looking forward to your questions and, and answers. And yeah, I agree. Um, we uh, got to know each other quite well while we were in Madrid beginning of February and six amazing weeks in, um, in Madrid. And yeah, um, again, looking forward to this episode and looking forward to a more nice uh, moment with you. Thanks for being here again, Nico. Let's just uh, address the first or the only topic that we want to be talking here today is Borussia Dortmund. We will be talking about that. And let's see how we get along with it. We want to address a lot of topics, right, from their glory years to their transfer strategy now, their identity, their philosophy, and uh, their struggles in the financial market in the uh, beginning of the century. And also, how could we forget the man who brought the glory years back in the form of Jurgen Klopp and what is happening at the current situation? And is Dortmund the only club who can again, and Bayern's dominance. Nico. I, for one, coming from the land of cricket, I was introduced to football when I was 12 years old. The first and foremost, the most like anticipating question would be, how did you get to know about Borussia Dortmund and why exactly do you support it? And uh, yeah, me being a football fan, it's very easy to not ask the question as to how do you stick to a club that has its ups and downs, and especially a small working working class city, like in your case, Dortmund, or in my case, even Liverpool, when we've had more lows than highs. Of course, we've had peaks where we've really peaked and we've really killed it and the glory days have returned. You could basically start with how and why Dortmund. Well, in general, I would say how you, how you get into a club, how you connect to a club, is there are two ways. It can, it can also be a mixture of, of both, yeah, right? There's this distance, yeah, where you where you grow up, um, and if there's a, a football club uh, close, then you might connect to this club. And then there's also this, especially if you are a young guy, um, there's also the reason of success. So when you when you watch a game, I remember when I watched a game the first time um, on TV, uh, there was actually a, a Dortmund game, and it was uh, and as you mentioned. The glory 90s, yeah, 95, um, where they were quite successful. And of course, uh, as, a, as, a, as a young boy, as a child, you, um, you easily, connect to, uh, easily connect to clubs um, which are successful in Dortmund back in the days. It was quite successful. So that was one reason. And I earlier mentioned that um, it can be a mixture. Of course, I grew up in not exactly Dortmund, called Witten. But it's actually, I grew up 100 meters from the border to Dortmund. So basically, when I went out of my um, my house, go up the hill, I could see the stadium from Dortmund. Oh, wow. So that was, um, yeah, that 
very natural connection. Um, why would I? Why would I go to a different club? This one is so successful and so close, and this is how I become a Dortmund fan. It it increased this feeling for Borussia Dortmund when a good friend of my mom went to the first time to the stadium. This was '96. I remember the first game it was against San Pauli. They played uh, in the first division, and we won two one against San Pauli. Right, man. Amazing feeling. Yeah, right, Very man. I, I guess I guess your mom's friend exactly knew when to take you to a game because right then in the three years or four years before that and the season that you went to the game was when Dortmund were really uh, making a name for themselves. Tell me, like, you were six, seven? Mm-hmm. Or six. The first time you went to a stadium. Yeah. What was the feeling for you? And how... Do you do you do you remember that day like it was yesterday? Um, yeah, I do actually. Um, the friend of my mom to to tell you how it how it works, and you probably know. This is how um, this is how children get into the stadium. Right? Yeah. Either their father or a good friend takes his or her son into the stadium. You know, and um, hey, let's go to the stadium. Let's let's get this experience. That that's how children also get connected to a club, right? Um, and yes, um, the, the friend of my mom, he gave me this uh, BBB uh, scarf and um, we met uh, We met at our house. We, uh, we drove through the, to the stadium and uh, to be honest, it was uh, kind of overwhelming, right? Yeah, 80,000 uh, people. In, in the first place. Well, back, back in the days, it wasn't um, 80,000 people. The okay. stadium was much smaller. We, we didn't have the corners. So it was, I think, 60, 65,000 people, but still it was oh, wow. the biggest stadium in, in Germany. Yeah. It was sold out, I I assume. Yeah, I guess it was sold out. Tell me a day when it is not sold out. <laughs> <laughs> and as a young guy, six years old, just seeing 60,000 people for the first time, not a TV live, and then this pitch, 22 players, um, this atmosphere in the stadium, um, yeah, that's, I think, where, where it uh, got me. Yeah, were you, were you like, what was the best part of that experience? Like, were you already into the songs? Uh, the the fans were singing, or you were just in awe. Oh, okay, there's a football pitch. My team, not my team, but this is a team that I might be following for the rest of my life. Apart from the fact that there were sixty thousand people that were overwhelming you, what really got you in in a state of awe? Oh. I think it was the atmosphere and the the people who were next to me. I mean, all, all the people in the stadium. It was just an amazing atmosphere, and I um, I really felt as a young boy, I felt welcomed. Right? Because yes. It was not like Okay, there's a young boy, and um, you know how it is as a young child. You are quite nervous, right? But everybody was everybody was welcomed, and everybody was so happy. I mean, we won the game, and I cannot imagine if we would have <laughs> lose. Right? Yeah. Might might be that I'm uh, today. I would have would be a Pauli fan, fan or a Pauli <laughs> fan. Yes, exactly. But we won, and um, yeah, I think back to your question, it was. Um, it was the atmosphere in the stadium. Did you, uh, so that season, did you end up going to a few more games? Or that it was, was the only game. game? It was the only game. It was the only game, and then it took one or two more years um, until I went um, again to the stadium for my yeah. second visit. Um, so I followed in, uh, followed on TV the mm-hmm. Dortmund games, um, and but the decision was made, right? I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't choose another club. Yeah. The decision was made after the stadium visit, and... Um, yeah, I watched uh, watched a lot of games, and then after two years, one and a half years, I went again to the stadium. And then it was more and more frequently. The older I got, you know, yeah. of course, my mom wouldn't let me as a as a ten year old boy. She wouldn't let me go into the stadium by, just right. by myself. But um, yes, as I said, friends from uh, our family friends sometimes they took me. And then when I got fourteen, fifteen, I I got the season card. So you get it that early? Yes. And then, uh, were you still accompanied by your mom, or no? You went by yourself. I think it was fifteen. With fifteen, I got my season card. No, actually, I was then with my uh, um, with a friend from school. Mm-hmm. Um, we went together always. We could take the bus directly to the stadium. Not directly, but it took us maybe twenty minutes, twenty five minutes to yeah. go from from my place from home to the stadium. And yes, my mom was fine with that. I mean, it was already. Fifteen. Yeah. So she she trusted me. When was um, your first stadium visit? In general, it can be can be any game. Yeah. So it took me a while. When I was 
23. So like right, right. 17 years later than you. <laughs> But I really hit it to the top. So my first stadium visit was at the World Cup. Okay. Yeah. Oh, which game? I'm a Liverpool fan, uh, supporting the club, but as as a national supporter because we don't do as an Indian we don't do so well in football. Uh, we obviously have a second team, and I support the German football team. Uh, and for the World Cup, I went for the game where Germany was playing South Korea, Kazan, and uh, I was all hyped up. I mean, it was also like a very intense, uh, nervous feeling because they had to win. But uh, yeah, in my mind, I was like, okay, come on. South Korea. Yeah. yeah. Everybody thought this. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I was I was thinking like, uh, yeah, how how basic or a natural uh, German football fan would think. Yeah, it didn't go well. And then after 90 minutes, it just exploded. All of a sudden, like the entire game, you didn't see South Koreans, and all of a sudden, after 90 minutes, you turned all around. There were South Koreans. <laughs> so. It was it was a very interesting experience because like with World Cups it's it's a completely yeah it's 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 the biggest carnival you can attend and uh, of course there were Germans there were South Koreans and Russians of course because the host country will always have people from their from the same country attending various games even though some of them don't normally watch football but they just go for the experience but yeah it was one hell of a, one hell of an experience for that uh, then. Afterwards, of course, a year later, I came, I came to Berlin, and then I was more frequently into games. I was like, okay, one, I don't know how there are there are various ways to connect to Berlin, and I thought maybe I could uh, I could connect via via Hertha. Uh, even the football, like ball in Berlin, is you can't say it's not big, but the clubs are not that big compared to the other Bundesliga clubs. But there are two clubs in one city. So yeah, this is quite rare. And that's quite yeah. And also, they stand falls in the first division, right? This is um, this is unique in the in the German league right now. I mean, there was of course Hamburg and St. Pauli playing for, uh, in the in the first league. Now they're playing in the second league, but they're playing together. So. Now they're playing in the second league together, right? There was back in the days um, 1860 München and Bayern were playing yeah. in the same league, but this now for for Berlin, I um, yeah, I. Yeah, it's quite unique uh, yeah. because uh, last year when when Union got promoted, it was like the first time since '90. Also, uh, when the wall came down, so that two Berlin clubs would be playing in the same division, which is also like you mentioned quite a rare feat. And yeah, I started following games for Hertha. Went to went to the stadiums to watch all the big games. And yeah, now uh, a very can't say loyal, but a very keen observer. Of what's happening around around uh, Hertha, so my second club. If I want to call Berlin my home, so I have to adopt Hertha as my second club. And yeah, but I I feel that we are in the twenty first century, very liberal people into science. But I want to quote Michael Scott here. I'm not a bit so I'm I'm not superstitious, but I'm a little bit superstitious. <laughs> so all my visits to the stadium mm-hmm. where I've gone to to support my team, every time they've lost. So with with Germany for the World Cup they lost to South Korea. Then I went to Hertha's first game to Leverkusen. This was 2019, end of the season, last match day. They lost five three or five one, five three. Yeah. And then in Madrid I went to watch my club for the first time ever. By the way, the shout out is Liverpool. Yeah, shout out. It's an impressive stadium, Wanda. I I loved it that Atletico Madrid uh, were tweeting, hey, when the draw was made out. Welcome to your second home because that's where Liverpool won their sixth championship. But just to finish it on that, that didn't go quite well. So I'm hoping that my that my second visits are better because my second visit for the Hertha game they won was in Paderborn. Yeah, if 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 the European Championships were held this this summer, uh, even though Germany had really tough games, Portugal, France. I guess my second game, or I hope that they would win the second game. And the second game I go for the Liverpool game. Hopefully. The result changes, but anyway, when you're growing up, you know how is it? It culturally, like every week, there's football. Like football is big in Germany. You watch your team, and especially when you got into Dortmund, right when they were like, like I mentioned before, making a name for themselves. How was the conversation going back to school? Like every Monday morning, because and also, did you have? Because you said that your place was located so close to Dortmund, your entire friend circle were Dortmund fans. Not my entire friends. Okay. My entire friends, but 
of course, I choose uh, my really good friends for Dortmund fans. Okay, so then there was there was there was just this ma- merry conversation, yeah? yeah, that we won or like everybody sobbing. If yeah. yeah, but there must have not been a lot of sobbing <laughs> yeah. during those days. Well, you couldn't really escape from that um, football enthusiasm um, because you on a on a Saturday, even if you forgot. Hey, today is a game. You could see it. You couldn't escape. There were people on the street wearing BVB uh, yeah. jerseys, scarves. You know, so ah, today is a Dortmund game. Um, and and this was not only people going to the stadium, right? There's a big amount of people going to going to bars and pubs and watching the game, right? Yeah. Because there's so much, and still there's so much enthusiasm for for this club. I and mean, in the city which is, from my opinion, also unique. Um, not everybody can go into the stadium, right? We have um, 50,000 season card holders, and oh, wow. they, they, would give a, they would give a shit to, um, to give back their season card, right? There's a waiting list of, um, I think, 50 or 60,000 more people. They are on the waiting list. And each, uh, each season, 50 or 100 people give back their season card. Yeah. Right? So there's still this big enthusiasm. And also back in the days, um, you were always confronted with... Um, with, uh, with the game, with the club, and um, also in school, yes, also in school. Even our teachers, they were either Borussia Dortmund fan or they were Schalke Mafia fan or VfL Bochum, right? Which is this is this is the thing in, in, in the Ruhrgebiet, in the Ruhrgebiet, that you have clubs located, clubs located very close to each other, right? From Dortmund city center to Schalke um, to Gelsenkirchen, it's 20 kilometers. From uh, from Dortmund to Bochum, it's 50. Yeah. And you can reach every city within 10 to 15 minutes by train, right? Yeah. And the public transport is so well um, in the Ruhrgebiet that, um, yeah, the distances are so close. Um, and we have so many big clubs, Schalke and Dortmund, in this, in this area, right? And When you look at the football club distribution, yeah, of course, it's political based on how Germany was evolving during that time, based in the East. Also, like uh, you, you mentioned the fact that uh, getting from one city to other is so easy. I just want to mention another an article I came across is Germany bidding to host 32 Olympics, mm. and then they want to do it in around Westphalia. Yeah, they um, the IOC decided that also regions can apply for for Olympics. Right before that, it was just cities, cities, and then they decided a few years ago that also regions can uh, can apply for the Olympics. And then, and it, in my opinion, it, it, it totally makes sense that um, regions have the possibility to apply it. Also, um, that um, that the Ruhrgebiet, the Ruhr region, is applying for the for the Olympics. Definitely makes sense because we have the infrastructure. Right? Yeah, we have so many stadiums. Like the, the sport in general is well developed. The sport infrastructure in uh, in the Ruhrgebiet is well developed. So um, it's not like that. We have to build um, new stadiums. But I guess the IOC always finds a way to make it unsustainable. Yeah. But uh, let's not criticize them. Maybe I get them on my podcast one day. <laughs> but yeah, th- th- this is also one of the reasons why, and I love it with, with Germany, that people's opinions matter here. Yeah, because it was people living in Hamburg who refused for Hamburg to bid for the Olympics. Same in Munich. Yeah. Same in Munich. Yeah, because they are so afraid of the IOC or the USB decisions, right? Um, I mean, it costs a lot of money. It's tax money at the end of the day. Yes, right? yes. Um, it's the people's money. It's the people's money, exactly. Um, they are using for um, yeah for building up um, stadiums, um, building up new streets and everything, and also this um, gentry, gentry by section, or how do you call it? So it's, it's like when you have a poor area in the city, and the Olympics are coming, um, rents will increase. Maybe in that area there will be stadiums or whatever, and people move because they cannot afford the, the high rent. Right? This is also one reason uh, why, why people are against the Olympics, such a big city. Yeah, exactly. But then, yeah, you did not get to see the league championship until five years later when they won in 2002. So yes. how, how was the phase like? All of a sudden... But before that, I want to I want to touch upon very quickly. You said that you decided to become okay. Of course, you it comes from within that okay, this is my club and this is what who I'm going to commit to. I think it is <laughs> football clubs is the only commitment boys take seriously. But yeah, did you did you have a hand in having been influenced by external factors in terms of 
friends, maybe friends are also too young, but your your mom's friend or your your parents around. For sure. For yeah. Sure. It's it's the I think especially if you are a young boy, it's the, the social environment which has a lot of a lot of impact on your on your decisions, right? On your decisions in general, but also on football, right? If you are if 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 this this guy, this friend of my mom would have um, brought me to the um, to the Schalke Arena from a Park Stadium, who knows what what happened? Yeah. And luckily, he was a Borussia Dortmund fan. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I think it's a lot of um, the social environment, the people around you. Um, they have a, a big impact on your on your decisions, especially when you're. Yeah, which was uh, also I wanted to ask you then. Yeah, but I think it pretty much answers it. But I still want to ask. As the question that okay, why not Schalke or why not Bochum or even Munchen Gladbach? All all these clubs are they're still big in their own right and they're still around the region. Yeah. So was it just because you were taken to the game? Well, and I, also, I didn't I didn't feel the connection to those clubs. Right? But and also uh, before you went to the game, you you obviously were introduced to football before going to the games. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But also before you went to the stadium, did you already have this connection to Dortmund? Yes. Or you were just like there in your option? No, it was as, as I told you earlier. It was I. I followed um, Borussia Dortmund games on TV. Yeah. And I remember that um, that they were quite successful, right? That yes. was always in my mind. Yes. And again, as a young boy, you you follow the team which plays good and successful football, right? You you wouldn't you cannot differentiate as a young boy. You wouldn't follow a team which is always losing, right? Or playing playing not nice, right? Yeah. And um, in, in the 90s, of course, 95, Dortmund was playing a very good ball. So, um, yes, that was, um, I guess, um, a big reason. Also, before before my first stadium visit, why I, um, why I was supporting this club. I want to ask you, when did you apply for the season ticket? You told that, you already mentioned that you got it when you were 15. Yes. And did you also apply it together with your friend? Um... Or you have my, my friend had it already. Okay, he had it. And I applied. Um, I applied <coughs> afterwards. I think one year later, because I always um, before that I um, I bought single single tickets right for each game, and then I thought, and also my friend was uh, pushing me hey, man, get a season card. And back in the days, it was um, you can't imagine it was so easy to get a to get a season card. Yeah. Right? Even to get a to get a single ticket, it was so easy. You went on two days before the game. You went to um, went to the ticket shop and got a got a ticket and same with the season card I applied for a season card it was um, because I was under 18 mm -hmm. and a special special discount I think I paid for uh, for this season 120 euros oh wow can you imagine yeah. can you imagine he just, um, he, he just I mean bought. I was on this on the Zoo tribune right so I was standing I was not sitting right but that's also I think especially when you are young 14 15 16 this is what you need, right? This yeah. is where you grow up with, with this. This is where you want to put all your attention and your concentration. Exactly. You don't have a season ticket anymore. How did that That's happen? right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, how long did it get take for you to get your first season ticket? That very day. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. How long have you been waiting for your second season ticket? Um, I'm again on the waiting list since four years. I don't know. I haven't checked it um, Lately, but I don't know my place. So when I when I when it's my turn, I think it will. I won't get a season ticket anymore. Not through this uh, through this system through this waiting uh, waiting list. Maybe through through contacts, you know, through friends who want to give back their season card. But yeah, I'm on this list since four years. Um, I I had my season ticket from 15 to 19, and that was um, from 15 to 19. So this was 2006, seven uh, to 2011. Ooh, yeah, not a good time to sell it because we are going to come there. Well, it, no, it was it was from 2005 to 2009. So, yeah, yeah. So um, because I moved to uh, I moved to Hamburg for my studies and it didn't make sense for me to uh, to keep the season card, so I gave it away, uh, which was at the end a big mistake because in 2008 and um, Guess who came in? <laughs> um, Jürgen joined the club, and um, as we all know, um, he, he did a, quite a good job. And 
the performance of the team year by year. I mean, I remember when I um, when I had the season cut, I went to the really really shitty games. Right? When yeah, but also they were in transition, like 2005 falling apart. I don't know how how much you remember when you were 15 about that. Klopp joined seven after the World Cup a year later, eight. Yeah, eight. yeah. So still in transition. I think they finished ninth, eighth, seventh. Yeah, the first season, the first season of Jurgen Klopp, we um, missed the we missed the um, Europa League. No. Europa League, one place. I think we were sixth in the sixth place and um, qualified mm-hmm. were the first um, five teams. So we almost missed. You have to know before that we were uh, we were really struggling. We were almost going to the second division. Yeah. Right. It was um, after two thousand after two thousand two we won the championship and then we had some really really bad uh, bad years. Um, there was also a financial crisis, almost going into administration. Um, that was How much of it do you remember as as like beginning of your teens? You know that. <laughs> do you, Do you fear? Oh my God! The the club that I've been supporting for four years, the club that I've wanted to support all my life, is in big trouble, and I, as a twelve year old, cannot help because, well, come on, I don't have five million euros. How How is it? What kind of emotions go through you, like you being in a helpless situation and also you uh, fearing for the worst that your club just dissolves and then you just can't walk 100 meters top of the hill and see the stadium. You might still see the stadium, but it is being converted into some different uh, (laughs) multi-purpose stadium. Um, How much of it can you remember and what do you know about uh, Well, I can remember a lot because it affected my life. A lot. Um, it, it, it affected your life? It affected my life and the whole situation affected my life um, and I can uh, I have good memories. So, um, but uh, just before that, I just want to say, yeah, so Nico doesn't have his season ticket anymore, but guys, if you're listening to this and if you could connect to him and have some empathy, cut this clip of the podcast, send it to Borussia Dortmund. Borussia Dortmund, if you're hearing this, Nico hasn't clever needs his Season ticket back. Come on, man. You can find him at his Twitter handle. What's your Twitter handle, Nico? Come on. Um, it's Nico um, HCL. Yeah. Please, please find hey, him. Thanks, thanks for your support. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. He, he just shared his story. He needs a season ticket. Back. <laughs> it is. He got his first season ticket when he was 15 years old. He got it in a couple of hours. Now he's been on the waiting list for four years, and every year it's reducing by 100. What's your number on the waiting list? I, I, I don't know. Yeah, he doesn't know because uh, he's, he's almost given up. I mean, I guess he doesn't get his ticket when he's 60. So help my friend out, guys. <laughs> Dortmund, I know you're listening to this. But yeah, um, coming to the come, Coming back to, the, to your question. Um, so as I said, I have um, quite good memories. I wasn't really aware of this um, financial situation of Borussia Dortmund. So we won the German championship in uh, 2002, <clears throat> the last time. And uh, also in 2000... October, it is the only club that went to the stock market. Exactly, exactly, yeah. you are right. Um, so we won the German Championship in 2002 with uh, Matthias Sammer, and we were quite successful. But um, as I said, I wasn't really aware of the financial situation of Borussia Dortmund. I thought everything is everything is good. Um, we won the championship, we qualified for the Champions League, but then one year, everybody was expecting to qualify for the Champions League, but then in one game, I cannot remember who was the opponent, but we lost. Um, nobody was expecting this, and we uh, we haven't reached uh, the Champions League group stage. So we lost a lot of money, and the, the management of Dortmund was expecting this that we reached the final. We was calculating. We, we already signed new players, right? We yeah. signed the best players. So that was the strategy back in the days, right? That we sign expensive, good players. Um, so under this mismanagement of um, uh, Gerd Niebaum and Michael Meyer. We were already almost um, bankruptcy, and um, I remember that day in 2005. I think it was in March or April. Um, I was 15, so um, um, and I got to know it maybe two weeks, three weeks before that this is going to be a very important day for Borussia Dortmund because um, if we if we won't convince these 400 investors of Borussia Dortmund yeah. that we uh, <coughs> that we pay back our uh, our debts. Yeah, if we won't convince them, then this club won't exist anymore. Right? This club who won three years before the the championship and um, and, and eight years before the the Champions League, right? Yeah. This club won't exist anymore. So 
it was Hans Joachim Batzke who joined that club in this financial crisis, who is still the, the president of Borussia Dortmund, who joined this club, which was, yeah, it's, um, I, I, I'm still really happy that he He's still it was, it was the right man at the right time. Yeah. And he was in this event happened in Düsseldorf. Um, so this 400 uh, investors, they met with the, uh, with the management of Borussia Dortmund, Hans Joachim Batzke, and they convinced the investor that They, they uh, handed out a plan that they will um, pay, back, uh, pay back the debts in a few years. And they convinced them and uh, we survived, end of the story. And now we, as you know, there are no more debts anymore. We have a very good financial situation, I would say, um, behind Bayern Munich, of course, which is what also Hans-Joachim Batzke said uh, recently, decades, decades away from us. But yeah, we have a quite a good financial situation, I would say, right now. And... Um, Yeah, but the COVID situation hasn't helped, but I think it's going to affect everyone. Sure. They announced a loss of minus 42 million yeah. euros before yeah. tax. But every, but like this COVID situation affects everybody. Everybody. Right? So everybody. everybody it's not like that it's back in, in 2005, yeah. it was, it was, the story was about, just about Dortmund, right? If they, if they're going to survive or not. And yes, and to your question, I was listening to the radio and there was this, uh, this commentator, this reporter, and he was like, giving an update every five minutes, yeah, what does the investor say? And then at the end, there was this, luckily, uh, this decision, they, they're going to trust in the new management and Dortmund will survive. And also, the radio thing that you're saying, was, was the update day by day or did this happen in one day? This happened in one day. It was one day in Dusseldorf where they met in the, yeah. Yeah, in, in the city, in, in a hotel or something. And then, I cannot say it was, I had tears in my, yeah, maybe I had tears in my, very emotional moment for me. Because they survived or because what they were going through? Because they survived. That was all for today's episode. Join us next week as we want to talk about Dortmund's philosophy and whether winning a championship is everything. Until then, stay awesome, stay healthy and so on.